I've got an acute sense of smell, which is why I just so well in the perfume counter. Yeah, I bet. I can check the bottom notes, the middle notes, and the top notes <laughs> of your fragrance that you're wearing. Can you? Know. Oh, and what are they? Um, Link Safari. Ah, okay. No, what is it? Uh, no, it's Bulgari Man. Nice. <laughs> Which is my favourite. Yeah. I've just ordered so much, Lou, because it's quite hard to buy fragrance at the moment because mm. they're not putting the testers out. But I know that I like um, Better There. Yeah. So I've gone for that one. Yeah, it's... Yeah, Bulgari Man is one that I always... It's my go-to, really, and I just thought, I'll just get that. Cause I, it's a classic. Yeah. Right, shall we do it? Yeah. Welcome to What That Old Queen, a candid and adult take on queer life quandaries at a certain age. So please listen at your own discretion. Presented by Bernie and Tommy, their views are their own and in no way reflect those of any service you may hear this program on. Now, let your ears be upstanding for the <coughs> old queen. How are you feeling, Tommy? Well, yesterday I had my second vaccine, so I'm not great. <laughs> and I'm not great for other reasons, so... <laughs> yeah, I just feel sort of achy, a bit shivery and tired. Mm. And you've got a hangover. And I'm tired and emotional. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll mull through mm. like we do. <laughs> How's your week been? Um, I went to the dentist... Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I just had a sort of small filling done because I apparently um, uh, I, I drink too much citrus. Right. So it's been eroding one of my cavities. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I was inquiring about... Because my bottom teeth are quite wonky and they've gone, grown more wonky right. as the years have gone. And so I'm quite curious about having a brace fitted. Oh, yeah, because you can get those invisible ones now, can't you? Well, I don't think that they, they can put an invisible one on me. They were talking about metal tracks or or clear ones, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're kind of invisible. And so they're referring me to the orthodontist, but they asked, they answered lots of questions that I had. But the one question, because they said, you, the only time that you're allowed to take it out is when you eat. Right. And I really wanted to know, can you give a good blowjob? <laughs> Wasn't, with, with one on. Wasn't one of our first Queens of Agony questions about if you had braces, could you rim? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, someone said to me, well, I think it counts as a source of eating of sorts. So yeah, it's probably true. Did, did you ask the dentist whether you could no, give I a didn't. blowjob? No, I didn't. But after that, I went straight to a coffee meeting with my friend Annabelle, who's got a 13-year-old daughter. And she said... At the meeting, she said, um, I'm going to have to not give you that much time, Tom, because I've got to pick my daughter up, my 13-year-old daughter from the orthodontist. And she's having a brace. And I said, well, do you think you could get her to ask the question <laughs> that I forgot to ask? Can I still give good blowjobs? And she said that she would run it past the daughter to ask. <laughs> so I can't wait to see whether the 13 year old daughter asked the dentist whether she can still give good blowjobs <laughs> um, so you haven't had any feedback from that yet no texts have come through okay yeah there's also um, there's an online thing that you can do where they they give you like little braces that you wear when you just wear them when you're sleeping and they're meant to straighten your teeth out uh, and it, it's meant to be really quick. Mm, yeah, I would be cautious about that. But yeah. It's like teeth whitening as well. You could get that online, and I'm not sure whether I would... I just want to do it officially because, mm. 
you know, you could end up in all sorts of mischief, couldn't you? You don't really want to damage your teeth or no. your gums, yeah. I've done some home whitening. I can tell. And it was fine. Can I have a look at your teeth? Your teeth don't... You don't really show your teeth when you talk very much, do you? No. Whereas I think my teeth come out quite a lot. It's just the way yeah, that maybe. my mouth is shaped. Yeah, my beard hides my teeth. Um, anyway, if any, um, you know, dentists want to sponsor the show... Please do email. Because it's expensive uh, work. Yeah, exactly. So, what have we got today? We've, well, we've got Les Childs as our guest. Yes, yeah. He's a bit of an icon. Yeah. Choreographer extraordinaire. Yeah, voguing pioneer. That's what we so, like. Yeah, so we're going to ask him lots of questions about that. But he kind of cut his teeth in ballroom culture in the 1980s mm. in New York which I think would be really nice to ask him about that, to find out what that was like. One of our memorable party nights in this flat, you ended up doing a lot of voguing, and you're, you've got very good knees for a man of your age, Bernie. I think after that night, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure my uh, I'm sure Les will be appalled at my voguing. Well, but, let's see. Uh, you yeah. know, you could give him a demo. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> depends how much alcohol I've had. <laughs> but before that, before he comes on, I thought we'd do a little history of ballroom culture because I know people that like, we think we know a lot about it, but it's only really come kind of to the forefront over here in recent years, hasn't it? Because of Paris is Burning, Pose, mm. and RuPaul's Drag Race, because pretty much that whole show is based on a ball yeah. competition, isn't it? And Madonna, I suppose, as well. She brought it into the mainstream. Yeah, voguing. But I didn't really... I don't think I became aware of the ballroom culture until a few years ago. Mm. So I thought it would be... Uh, well, she kind of she kind of made it, and, and then it became you wouldn't necessarily know the origin of it yeah exactly it was just uh, like it was a hit we didn't know over here where it really Which came is from typical of madonna really she always does that <laughs> doesn't she yeah she just steals from someone and then it's i was listening to malcolm mclaren as well because he did a song about that whereas i think he puts a lot more of the background and culture of voguing mm. in his lyrics for that so we've got some facts and rather a lot of facts <laughs> to get through yeah. about ballroom culture. So the history of it, uh, I didn't know this, but ballroom culture emerged in the 1920s in and around New York City. I knew it was a New York thing, but I didn't realise it started in the 1920s. But at the beginning, performers consisted mainly of white men putting on drag fashion shows. Black queens rarely participated, and when they did, they were expected to lighten their faces, which is seems really odd to me, but it was the 1920s. Uh, fed up with the restrictive and racist ball culture, the queer black ball community established their own underground ball culture in the 1960s. Ball culture in the 1960s contained very few categories, with primarily queens portraying Las Vegas showgirls. However, New York... New, can't speak tonight. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> New York Stonewall riots of the late 1960s when the queer people of colour stood up to the police changed self-perceptions within the subculture from feeling guilty and apologetic to feelings of self-acceptance and pride. Yeah. And so in the 1970s saw an expansion of ball participation as balls increased their numbers. So it's quite nice talking about balls, isn't it? Um, <laughs> increased their numbers and types of categories to allow inclusivity and involvement from everyone. Balls became a safe place for queer youth of colour, mainly blacks and Latinos and Latinas, to express themselves freely. Now, this is where your notes go from a bold, larger font that, to something smaller. So I'm going to struggle now. <laughs> I apologise for that. <laughs> ball culture, the house system, the ballroom community and similar terms described as underground LGBT subculture in the United States in which people walk 
i.e. compete for trophies and prizes at events known as balls. Those who walk often also dance and vogue, while others compete in various genres of drag, often trying to pace out a specific gender and social class. Most people involved with vocal ball culture <laughs> can't say it ball, ball culture ball culture yeah yeah belong to the houses led by a single leader do you think you would be in a house i'm in your house aren't i yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> the right answer i'm in the house of marshman <laughs> Um, so house parents can provide wisdom, guidance and care for young people who otherwise might be homeless or without a parental figure. Uh, house parents tend to provide housing, money and emotional support to people seeking guidance. They coordinate the overall image of the house, plan annual events for house bonding, they host competitive balls to raise money and the list of house parents' responsibilities continues to grow as the needs of the scene. Also, called families, are groups composed primarily of the LGBTQ plus community, the majority of which are African American or Latino, banded together under a respected house mother, sometimes a drag queen or a transgender person, but not always. There can also be a house father. I love that kind of role. Yeah. Well, you, yeah, you're the house mother, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> the competition, besides um, providing a support system for their members, the main function of their houses is to walk or compete against each other in balls in which they are judged by a panel of judges or dance skills, costume, general appearance and attitude. Participants dress according to a category in which they are competing. Um, dominated uh, today by contemporary hip-hop fashion and features much hip-hop music. These events are actually part of a vivacious and ever-changing culture. I love that word, vivacious. Mm. How it works, so if you're good, the judges will give you tens, tens, tens across the board. If you're not good, the judges will give you the chop. Sashay away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there is more to the ballroom scene than chopping, fierceness and shade. And there is more to voguing than striking a pose. Drag is a form of control. By looking good, one can feel good. By looking powerful, one can feel powerful. One can be powerful and therefore beauty begets control. Artifice equals power. Then again, it may be a bunch of bitches competing for trophies. <laughs> I hasten to add that, that I'm getting all this information from a website called No Shade. But obviously there's a bit of shade here. <laughs> Either way, it's fun. There is, of course, a distinction between the casual runway that would erupt at a normal club and the formal runway of a ball where there are judges and prizes and actual voguing. There's one, um, have you seen the masterclasses that they advertise? You yeah. can subscribe for like a whole year and you've got like all these, um, you know, celebrities and experts talking about like their area of expertise. Mm. And one of them is RuPaul. And he does um, sort of self-expression, I suppose it is. Yeah. And and the way he kind of promotes it or the way he introduces it is like his therapist said to him, um, you know, the power that you have when you're dragged up is actually also available when you're not in drag. Yeah. And it just really resonated with me. Yeah. I think one of the that's one of the things which, which kind of inspired me to become an actor because I think I was painfully shy. I mean, you wouldn't think I was a shy person, but a lot of actors are. And I found that act of putting on a costume and becoming someone else really empowering because I didn't have to be myself. So I wasn't really exposing me. I was exposing someone else. But actually, you are exposing yourself and that power is you. But by pretending to be someone else, it kind of gives you, it allows you to access it, doesn't it? Or putting on a costume. Anyway, the next one's you, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. Number eight. <laughs> yeah. <No. laughs> I've lost track. Having evolved over the years, the largest balls are competitions that go on as long as 10 hours. Wow. There can be dozens of categories in a single evening, no longer attracting the same number of spectators 
almost everyone comes to compete. Some of the trophies are 12 feet tall and grand prize can be can take home $1,000. Wow. What's the category tonight, Bernie Hodges? <laughs> Vivacious. I would say vivacious knitwear. <laughs> vivacious knitwear. <laughs> Blue. Blue across the board, obviously, <laughs> for me. Uh, so ballroom status, one can expedite progress in status by creating unforgettable moments, redefining the category or making an impact on the ballroom community. So you can be a star if you're new to the scene in like one year. You can be a statement, which is one to 10 years. You can be legendary if you're 10 to 15 years, an icon 15 to 20 years on the scene. And the Hall of Fame is 20 years and longer. I think we're definitely the Hall of Fame, aren't we? (laughs) Yeah, something quite static and sort of museum-like to the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Well, I I don't know. (laughs) I think with this podcast, we're proving that isn't the case. (laughs) Uh, And then categories include... Butch Queen. Hello. (laughs) Butch Queen in drag. Can you do a hello for that one? (laughs) Hello. (laughs) Femme Queen. Hi. (laughs) Butch Trans Man. All right. Woman. Well, hello. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then we've got face runway, fashion, sex siren, and body and realness. Yeah, I think we're giving the realness tonight. I hope so. So, there you go. In a nutshell, the ballroom culture in, like, 15 minutes. Did you watch Pose? <laughs> yes. I, have, I, didn't, uh, I haven't finished the second season yet, but, yeah, I really liked it. What did you think? I thought it was brilliant. I yeah. thought, you know, its terms of its casting was amazing, you know, that they put real trans people right in the heart of that show. Yeah. I think, yeah, I couldn't fault it. I want to watch it again, really, because I think it was one that really took over. And um, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think, I mean, that first season made me... I mean, a lot of the HIV and AIDS stuff just had me in floods, really. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because that it was in the 1980s, so I think we can ask Les Childs, what it was actually like on the real ballroom mm. scene in the 1980s and whether Pose is actually mm. a true representation of mm. that. I think it probably is mm. to a certain degree. I love thinking and talking about those roles that people play in terms of the family of the queers. Yeah. you know, And I'm thinking about that quite a lot in this new small piece that I'm making for Western Supermare in the sense that this sort of intergenerational exchange and knowledge of of queer people in the throughout you know through decades of time yeah it's sort of a beautiful thing really isn't it it really is and i think we in the lgbtq plus community we kind of we have to create our own family in a way because in many respects our families don't really understand us because they don't have the same they're not going through the same experience as we are so we have to have people around us that are who actually understand what we're going through and Mm. And who and what we are, mm. and uh, and I kind of love that. I kind mm. of you know, um, RuPaul always says you kind of choose your own family. Mm. Yeah. And I have quite a lot of young queers that I sort of take on that role as a bit of a mother figure too. And it's such a beautiful relationship that I have with them. That's very unjudgmental. You know, yeah. when I I can be quite sort of harsh on people. I think in terms of like they didn't turn up for this or, you know, or they're late or, you know, they just talked about themselves. But when it's someone from a younger generation, I just sort of, I tend to drop that much more and Mm. think that that it's something connected to the youth that I really want to nurture. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's another reason for us doing this podcast in a way, because a lot, like generations... Younger generations always think the generation above haven't gone through what they've gone through. But actually, we have, and we have similar experiences, and we have some wisdom to impart on that. And it's it's very easy sometimes to forget what you were like when you were younger, and I think it's always good to remember that and nurture that in other people. So I think that's great. Anyway, should we have a little break before Les... Uh, arrives on the dance hall. Arrives, <laughs> yeah. It starts Vogue starts voguing in the throne room, yeah. and um, <laughs> and he can tell us more about the actual realness of 
New York City ballrooms. So we will be back after this. Please like and share this podcast. <laughs> Tell all your friends you're listening. And if you can spare some cash, please donate to our Patreon or our button on our website. Oh yes, push the button on our website and give us some cash today. Oh yeah, yeah. A dooby dooby doo. Thanks for listening and all your support. We love you. Oh, yes, we do. (laughs) Right, so we're back and we have a fabulous guest, a voguing pioneer. Tommy, please introduce our fabulous guest. Um... Well, it's a lovely pleasure to introduce Les Charles to the throne room. Um, choreographer, mover, dancer, um, part of um, the Michael Clark company in the 1980s. How are you, Les? Lindsay Kemp. Don't forget Lindsay Kemp. And Lindsay I Kemp. Lindsay I didn't know Kemp. that. Yes, large things you children don't know about me, girl. Is everybody thinks she's a voguer? No, child. That's just part. I was in the Lindsay Kemp company in 19... 19- 77. So we've just done a whole lot of stuff around voguing, but Lindsay Kemp is just the big... big... Michael Clark, um, Bill Luther. I choreographed almost every pop video you've ever seen. I did choreograph all the acts on top of the pops during the 90s, a lot of them. I went on tours with... I choreographed the Rolling... uh, With Mick Jagger, with the Rolling Stones... Do you know all this? Well, uh, well uh, we've done a little bit of research. And okay. you, you did Eartha Kit as well. I did Eartha Kit in the very early, twice I did Miss Kit. Wow. Yes, I did Miss Kit in the 80s when she had a renaissance and she was doing, becoming a disco diva. Mm. Um, Cha-cha heels. Uh, yeah. No, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> was, she hadn't made a record yet. I don't think she'd done a Oh, really? Disco. It was at Legends. And it right. was like um, just sort of... Um, um, what would you call it? Um, uh, just an evening with Miss Kit, um, like a dinner, a dinner and evening. And she was incredibly nervous, as she always is. And I had two gorgeous men in dinner suits and bow ties next to her. Um, she was, oh, she was fabulous. She was fabulous. I mean, Eartha Kit. The most fascinating thing: she had these amazing dancers' arched feet. Which was um, which I was taken by, and that was in the early days. I can't remember. It was probably nineteen eighty three, eighty four, somewhere around there. Could have been eighty five, but I doubt it. And then I did her again for there was this show um, on TV called Viva Cabaret. I don't know if you remember it. Um, it's Sounds a familiar. Series. It was really good. You like people in a nightclub, and all these act um, stars came on um, in the early nineties. And the, the production were so nervous of her. And because I'd worked with her before, I said, oh, you go and talk to her. You can deal with her. And <laughs> we, had a little, we had a little fracas, but, you know. And I bumped into her in, in Italy at Rai Uno. I was stretching in the corridor. And the interesting, she knew she knew me, but she didn't know in what context. Right. So she was saying, darling, and how come she was the nicest person in the world. And... Um, She's often very happy when she's done the performance. I mean, what an honour to have, you know. Yeah. There's a whole sort of, like, influx of people making biopic films about, you know, mm-hmm. Judy Garland yes. or whatever. Yes. And I just yes. think that Eartha Kit would be an amazing film for someone to play. It would be amazing. I mean, she hung out with all the, those Hollywood greats, like James Dean and Brad. Mm. Um, Brando, those were her friends, you know, and, and she was in the Catherine Dunham company. She was amazing. When you look back and who she she was, and just for saying that, com- asking that confrontational question at the White House ruined her career. What was that? It, oh, I don't remember the end of that, and I don't want to say anything, but it, it's major. She said something to um, Nancy or something, and she then she was had something that was inappropriate concerning 
war or, you know, their involvement. And um, it just barred her, ruined her career. Oh, wow. Huge. No, that, no, that was, why am I talking about Nancy? This was in the 60s, I'm sorry. I think it was Johnson and his wife, yeah. Right. Well, we love her anyway, so. Of course we do, she's flawless, she's an icon, she's legendary. Yeah, totally. And talking of legendary, so c- can we go back to 1980s New York City ballroom scene? What was that like for you? Extraordinary. I mean, just going to New York anyway was, um, the, the scene was like taking a rocket ship and going to another planet. There's nothing to compare it with. And of course we performed the house of body map, you know, the body map, the house, we went over there. We performed for the love ball, Suzanne Barch's love ball, um, with the presence of Madonna and everybody. So all the houses had come together and we can contri- and you know, and we were in drag at the time, David and me, and I went to all these houses. I went to the Dorian Corey, we only had two people. There was Avis, and she says, who are you, the queen? I said, how could I rule amongst all you others? I'm merely a princess. <laughs> but they were really, they were really amazing. It was, um, of course, then I hadn't seen Paris is Burning. Actually, we're in it. There's this little snip in the newsreel where the House of Body Maps in it. And you had, you had RuPaul, Lady Bunny was in it. RuPaul, Lady Bunny, Sister Dimensha, Billy Beyond, all those children. Body Map, House of Body Map then, as we called it. But New York was an exciting place. It really had a magic and a fear about it. It was, you'd, you'd pass every corner, it would seem like you'd look for the camera because you would swear there was this was um, a film going on and it was real life, you know? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, it was desperate, it was scary and dangerous. You were, you were um, convinced you were going to get shot by a stray bullet, but that added to the excitement. Yeah. Did you go I mean, to I New York went, from London? Yes. We went, yes. We, I, we went over to party, basically, to go to all the clubs. We're in, Michael, when you were with the Michael Clark Company? When I was with Michael, I used to often go with Michael or, you know, um, I didn't leave Barry's scene. That, that, that whole thing came later in the 90s, that sort of, where they had the, what did they call them? The club kids. Club kids, yeah. yeah. Yeah, which I think were more in, inspired really by when we used to go over dressed up like crazy people in the house of body map, you know. And um, um, it was exciting and dangerous. We went to, clubs went on all night. You went from one club to one club. But the house ball scene was terrifying as well as fascinating. Mm. It was like no other place you'd seen. It just this gaggle of people. And of course, you went on for about five hours in these categories. And I was just scared to open my mouth. I didn't want to draw any attention. Mm. Because, um, you know, they have a different concept, yeah. totally, to light, which was... I imagine that you'd have to have a certain amount of strength and willpower to actually be able to still, you know, be alive now, be present. Do you think about that a lot? You know, when you get old, you become a legend. Just the fact you've outlived everybody. That, <laughs> yeah. that seems to be the case. Because yeah. um, you, no, you must have partied I really hard. Been, we, no, yeah, we partied, but we replenished. We had to get our pussies on that stage, go and get gorge. Yeah. So we couldn't party. We partied in New York, often flew over, and we had time to heal, right. you know. Didn't party too hard where I'd lost consciousness. I mean, I was wary. You know, that's it. Those, I didn't, I couldn't afford the luxury of those white children. You know, yeah. if I fucked up, honey, who's going to pick up my dead car because they put me into rehab and look after me? I don't think so. So I had to keep a grip on the situation. Are you talking about like other dancers that you were with? The other people that I knew, yes. Mm. I mean, we mostly, mostly dancers and and New York was fascinated and loved everything British at that time. I suppose it was like the 60s, and where they loved everything British, and they would drink, they would buy for um, Body Map's attention, because Body Map was a fashion house that was doing so well, where they'd fly us all over, offer limousines, one couple would offer limousine, one would offer um, drinks or hotels just to, to, I suppose it's like the way they get celebrities to DJ 
for mm. us to be there. And we just and stayed at Charlie Atlas's. I don't know if you know who Charlie Atlas is. Um, no, tell us. Yeah, this is a, a well-known filmmaker who worked with Merce Cunningham. He did all Merce Cunningham films. He's on a lot of independence. He's a legend in his own right. And he, he works on with Michael Clark all the time, does all of Michael's lightings. He did, if you've seen any of Mark, Mark, Michael Clark's films, mm. they're made by Charlie Atlas. All those, like in his exhibition, and all those were Charlie Atlas. What brought you to dance in the first place? I would seen with um, little white fairies in white tutus. And as a child, I just thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a fairy. I want to be like that and dance some point. I was obsessed. And I knew from that moment. And my parents weren't in a situation. To them, that you know, it was alien. It was mm. not part of like experience at all. So they just thought, no, Leslie, no, you know. Or my mom said, Mom, I want to go to ballet. As I said before, ballet, I feel woman. Man don't do ballet. So I would sneak and go, my manage to get pocket money and go to this school nearby in this little posh area. Yes, and she would say, um, I don't do boys. We only do girls. And I begged her and she took me on. Wow. And um, no one knew in the secret. When I was a child, I was like a child hero. We did um, Gilbert and Sullivan at my junior school. Of course, I played Bun Thorn or just of Josie Porter. And he was like all in the press, you know, it's this big thing. So my parents, again, didn't understand it. I was never, ever praised or sort of, um, you know, had a sort of a mother that pushed me. You were all right, Leslie. You know, there were eight of us, 10 of us. She couldn't give one more attention. And, you know, it's clever. I went, is that what she says? All right. And everyone's going crazy about me. But that's all I would get from my mother. You were all right. In terms of like representation of people in colour in dance, do you think that's got better now? Because I would imagine you as a young child seeing, you know, probably white dancers doing swan I didn't leg even or whatever. Think about it. I didn't think about it to honest to God, you know. I just thought if that was something I want to do, I didn't see there was any boundaries, barriers. I thought, why can't? I didn't the colour thing didn't come to later, you know. And so I would do, and I'd do it, and I'd get it, you know, which was fascinating. The colour thing only came. Um, it hasn't really got much better. It's just there as a sort of this whole diversity thing to address the balance. But you know, in the or in the dance where it's still elitist and racist, mm. I get everything. And what do you think can be I'm done to resolve right. that? Mm? What do you think can be done to... What questions are you asking me, Tom? I don't know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what, say, what, what, what can be done to resolve it? Yeah. It's a baffling question mm. because, I mean, you know, it's an ongoing thing. And I don't think... I, I can't say. I, in the 70s, I went on demonstrations and for um, gender equality, race equality women, you know, um, police brutality. I mean, honestly, I would think I'd had so much optimism in the future. I thought by this time, we'd all be holding hands like rainbow children, where colour wasn't an issue. It was all just love and respect. I'm shocked that it's gone nowhere. It's actually regressed. Mm. Frightening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all press and media. It's really frightening, you know? Yeah. I mean, what's happening in America? I wish I could say what the resolution was, but I can't. I don't yeah. have the answer. It's kind of ingrained, isn't it? It's just yeah, oh, something yeah, we've got to yes. work through. But uh, but exactly. I guess, so when you went to those balls in America, which were kind of empowering uh, African-Americans and Latinos. Yes. And, and gay. It was a celebration of gay and, and not ashamed. Not, there was no sort of um, pretense. There was no fronting or pretending. It was a celebration. I, I am who I am. Yeah. I'm making no apologies for it. Did that was, it was celebrated. It, that was amazing. Was that a real kind of eye opener for you as well? Was it? Did did it encourage you in in, in many respects? No, I was a, I was there already, child. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 but I just like to quote you back by saying it was part what of your say? evolution. Yeah, because I, I, 
I mean, did it blow your mind when you got introduced to Vogue and evolving. stuff? I'm growing. We're forever evolving. Yeah, Whatever yeah. We do. We're forever growing. Even at this point of our life, I'm still evolving. And I'm loving this point where I'm still realizing and understanding things, the wisdom of it brings and experience, you know. And what was the experience like? Because I just loved you in the TV show glow up they all seem to love me in these shows Child, I, don't, I, don't I want to see I, I want to see you, know you more is, on Tom, tv i honestly think it is just truth i'm just i couldn't give a shit what anyone says or do i'm i'm i am who i am and there's no pretense you know i'm not licking their ass because i want to be in the next series i couldn't care beyond that because i know that's not the way the world works it's in that moment in time and that and that is a real privilege Mm. to go somewhere and just be who you are on fashion sets they employ me is a brilliant italian word for it just for an energy and Mm -hmm. i don't contrive anything i'm not pretending you know it's it's bizarre to me Mm. i did an amazing show recently um the fendi fendi couture for kim jones with all the girls you know naomi's your kate mosses who i know all these children and it was fantastic, you know, and they sort of had their respect, you know, when I demanded, they did something, they were very professional, I mean, and did it. And it was it was very um, flattering that they took on that and applied it, you know, and they were very professional. But that's how my life is. It's continue. it's full of surprises. Mm. And I'm loving the surprises. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen next week, next week, I don't know. It's like, oh, go, go. It's always been full of surprises. Amazing. I love the fact that you, when you were judging on uh, Glow Up, it, it, you had that, the thing that... I going to play for I've seen it once, I ain't watching it again. Well, <laughs> well, no, it was just, it's just like, you had that thing that most choreographers have, which is like the iron fist in a velvet glove, <laughs> mm. <laughs> in terms mm. of telling it like it is. And yes, I love yes. that. Because I, I'm not working, I'm there for myself. You know, if mm. they want you to be like act like a certain way to be a ridiculous puppet or, you know, the joker. I ain't doing it, honey. You know, I've got my integrity and respect. And I'm representing, which is another thing. Everything, gay, colour, myself, my truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my honesty. And that, what a brilliant, I had brilliant parents, you see. And then I never said I was never reprimanded for being who I was and what I wanted to be. And I just never saw any boundaries. That didn't come till later. I mean, when I came to London and had doors slammed in my face, looking for a flat because I was black. Wow. You know, I just thought, oh, whatever. And that's a brilliant thing with you, actually. You can just brush it off, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So- I loved um, watching you on the Sue Tilly life drawing thing that they did on Facebook. Oh, really? Um, and I wanted to oh, say oh, one oh, word oh. to you about that. So child. Eternal. Don't you? I, 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 got, no, I can't say these things. <laughs> when we private, girl, I'll tell you every motherfucking thing. <laughs> I don't watch what gets out. We'll leave that for another show or another time. You know. Well, I think that it's still available you mean, to don't watch. Don't you mean infernal? <laughs> <laughs> I'm imagining that you haven't kept up with the eternal women. Oh, stop it. I'm not going to go there. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Let's let's draw the interview to a close there. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. We, no, but we're going to do a Queen's of Agony thing. So we're, you're going to stay on board and get put your okay, two pen in for that. Because I think you'll be really thank good. You. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you said what you said when I did the shows and that you liked... I was the, the response has been extraordinary. I, it, I mean, I was nervous as hell. I was the size of a house from lockdown, watching Netflix, stopping my face, terrified, you know, that they're going to show the big old belly, you know, and then getting all this Dior clothes that all Dior sent to me and hardly any bit fit. I was head to put in Dior, darling. And, um, but it was good. I was happy that, you know, that it wasn't as bad as I thought. It's, it's, it's exactly what you said. It came across that you were just 
you were just yourself and everyone just loved you for it and you were just brilliant oh, and I, I reckon you're gonna get I, I see your own show coming i definitely do that's what everybody says yeah it depends on the coins darling of course and it depends on the situation you know i don't yeah, want to yeah. be a one minute moment you know a thing and then they diss away you know as long you know i don't think you, you could ever be a one minute moment <laughs> anyway let's i'm gonna do a big gong we have a little gong bath before we do the uh, the queens of again. agony let's say it again John. we, we have gang bang or <laughs> gong bath we have a gong bath before we do the queens of agony so i'm just gonna do a big gong and um i've got some lengthy questions here for us to put right Wow. And these are what people have um, written in and asked. Yeah. So, wow. How fantastic. So, um, so we want you to be unapologetically yourself in your answers, <laughs> Les. <laughs> because we will be. <laughs> oh, I've got to meet you like children in the flesh. You're fierce. Really love- <laughs> totally. We can do this in person next time when out okay. of this bloody okay. pandemic. Right. Yeah. So, dear old queens, I'm including you in the pantheon of that. Um, when did tops versus bottoms become so prevalent? <laughs> no, and so exactly, good question. Yeah, actually, I thought you might like this one. Um, yeah. Many more of seasoned gay friends have told me about their coming of age stories in the seventies and eighties, and how whether you were a top or bottom didn't come into play as much as it does today. It was as simple but it wasn't as so open. Remember that the coded thing yeah, on the yeah, right yeah. side and the left side. Remember there was that. Yeah, there Even was. Of, yeah, the whole yeah, hanky code. The handkerchief, stuff. or if you wore your keys on the right, you were passive. If you wore them on the left, you were active. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Code. So yeah. it was always there. But the proud thing, remember. Um, Let's see how the question pans out before we give the answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's all right, Anne. So. It was as simple as two gay men finding a way to get off with each other. I find it odd to put so much restriction and importance on what position you prefer in bed. At least for those of us who are more in accepting regions of the world, gay men are sexually liberated. Why are we insisting on pushing these restrictive stereotypes on ourselves? Are the apps to blame for the polarisation in images of what a top or a bottom is? Or did the importance of whether you were top or bottom come into play before that? Do you find this as annoying as me? Or perhaps it's just my versatile privilege talking? That's a versatile privilege because they all want it up the arse, honey. <laughs> Even if they want to yes, get it straight, bitch. You know, everyone wants it up their pussy hole. Even they're coming up some big old butch top thing. That's very worrying, you know. <laughs> like there's, something, there's some issue there. But versatile, even versatile, they want to they want, they want taste what it like, you know. Yeah, of course. I, think it, I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. Where it becomes an issue. Remember that the, um, there was a celebration of being um, a queen, a bottom. Remember all these videos that came out and yeah. queens just showing their batty, proud to have it up the, you know, taking it. And um, it was like, oh, oh, she's just, oh, she's just a big old bottom girl. Again, trivialising her because she's just, you know, well, what are you, bitch? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Everyone, you know what I mean? Um, it's really interesting. So, but do you think it's always been there, or is this yeah, is this a I recent think, thing? Who's the man and who's the woman? You know, the straight yeah. people always ask. I hate that. It's horrible. Yeah, of course it's horrible. But it's quite a justified question because who's not thinking it? Everybody's thinking it, aren't they? Yeah, I guess generally, and um, people would get it wrong as well. You know, I never forget being at heaven once, and there was this most gorgeous handsome piece of stink you know standing there with this really sort of naff um skinny emaciated not attractive sort of um she, i wouldn't say she was a drag queen she was just sort of femme queen mm. guess who was doing who guess who was top and who was bottom so those things you know it wasn't so obvious people would think oh because he's, he looks like the man he must be the top mm. That's generally, it was the other way around. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't make any assumptions. Hello. Thank you. But t- I think there's a PhD in this question. Do you? Yeah. Um, I th- it's interesting, I think, isn't yeah, it? There's a th- there, definitely. Definitely. There's a study in it. 
Yeah. But would you ever come to any conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know if we do. I think, it, I think by the end of it, you'll just think, oh, fuck it. Let's just have a fuck. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's, <laughs> thank you, Danny. Let's just frottage, rub against yeah. each other. I think when I, I, I love the word frottage. A frottage is gorgeous. I've got one. She's a part, I mean, you know, really. I'm not necessarily a top. As I've grown older, I've realised that I'm pretty assertive. I'd have to be the boss, but I'll tell them what to do. Mm-hmm. Even if they come top, you know the top. Next minute they've got their legs in the air. I went, go, bitch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's all part of getting older, that luxury of knowledge. Yeah. That things aren't always what they seem to be. And that you can like certain things. I like it because it's just so sexy. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, because it's something else. It, and we get off on each other and it's it's nice, you know. It doesn't have to always be penetrative sex. I'm not going to that at the moment. My, my, my pussy's so... <laughs> <laughs> but I, th- I think you're right we, we have a lot of questions about anal and stuff like that and I think people get really hung up on it and I think people do get hung up on what, what people's roles are and it's just like if you fancy totally. someone I mean, just exactly. have some fun it was like the gay the gay choreography you know like everyone's acting all but you know the way you're supposed to act and that kind of put me off gaming because they weren't being honest yeah 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 you know, that, oh yeah, this is what you assume that I want, all this posturing. Give me a queen that is just comfortable with herself, a true, and you know, she must be happier in the end. Well, that's that's, that's interesting because there's another question later on which might hark back, harken back to what you've just said, actually. So let's move on to the next one. Dear old queens, rekindling an old connection. So I met a guy back in November and we went on a couple of dates then lockdown hit hard here and I was struggling with juggling having a social life and being diligent about my job in a hospital. I didn't want to risk lives so I told him that it was it was a difficult time for me and that the stress of always having to think about infecting him with COVID or him infecting me and infecting patients was too great so we stopped seeing each other. I got the feeling that he respected my decision and that he understood it i kept his number and now i'm wondering if i should reach out to him if so do you have any tips on how to approach the situation just a simple hi i would say hello yeah, hi how are you yeah, he's saying no can't you sure i've moved on or lie or something i've got a boyfriend at yeah. least you'll know that you'll know the answer i think there's going to be a lot of these things because a lot of people have like put their love life and sex life on hold because mm-hmm. of the pandemic mm-hmm. haven't they but i don't, yeah. don't think there's any harm oh, really <laughs> the same point. There's lots of love. Okay, when it comes, to God. someone sent me. Um, it was a viral thing that was, went around. It was all about you know di- um, self distancing and you know isolating. And there was a, a film at someone's house. This huge orgy. <gasps> it, it was so irresponsible. It was shocking. Wow. They were all quite young, and they all looked sort of dark. They were just going for it. Was it, meant, it was mental actually. Well, yeah, obviously, people find a way and it still goes on, doesn't it? Yeah. But I can understand this this guy working in a hospital, he's being responsible. Yes, definitely. So I, I, and I think other people have done that. So I don't, don't I think, see yes, the sin- That's really nice and honourable, but I think it's always in the moment, you know, especially with the sex thing with men. Yeah. You know, it was like, in then that moment, maybe the one really just wanted to have the sex regardless. Who knows? But I think he should get in and uh, get in touch, as Tom said, and ask. Yeah, just reach out, and uh, yeah, as you said, they can only say no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Uh, dear old queens, non-sexualized spaces for gay men. Do they really non-sexual. even exist? <laughs> non-sexualized non- spaces for gay men. What's that mean? Well, <laughs> let, let me elaborate for you. Okay. So I need to get out of the bar scene for a number of reasons. But one of yeah. the biggest ones is I just rarely find that I can have a casual, carefree time in them. I often end up getting feasted upon by multiple guys sexually at once, and it just becomes a stressful experience. I oh, often oh, like to baby. go out to just have a casual, engaging time with other people and rarely am in the mood for a sexual conquest. 
So where might I go for a less stressful social, or is this just wishful thinking? I just oh, thought like a yeah. little gay men's walking group might be fun. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of things you could do which are, uh, doesn't involve going in, like to a bar and which it's is a bit so of a meat hot market. And so gorgeous, people just give me a hard time because <laughs> it's, it's desirable. Oh, you poor thing! Tell us <laughs> ten years time when you can't get a piece of cock love. Get real. <laughs> but, you know, going to get therapy, you know, I'm so beautiful. It's so, you know. It's so terrible when, for me. When, when you, yes, do that when you start to walk down the street and no one's looking at you or go to a bar and you're invisible. Yes. This is exactly why I thought you'd be good in this section. <laughs> <laughs> you tell it like it is, girl. We're always really safe with this stuff, oh, aren't we? Hate me. No, they're, they're not. Gonna hate me. Everybody's going to love you. Oh, no, it's that thing I think about that, yeah, saying what everyone's thinking. Mm. Exactly. Thank you, Tom. Totally. Right. Okay. Well, that's definitely answered that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this so this is one which harks back to what you said before. So, romance as a kink. <laughs> right? I don't know why I found that so funny. So, wow, it's just interesting, no, isn't it? it? So, I met... It is an interesting perspective. It's r true. R I mean, right? It's well, let me elaborate again. Sorry. So, I met this guy last weekend, and we were talking about our kinks. He mentioned that he was at, he has romance as a kink, and it made me laugh, like it did you, Tom. I thought he was just trying to jokingly hint that he wasn't looking for a relationship. But I've been thinking about it today, and I realise he was being serious. So much of our night was spent being affectionate with the other, cuddling. It was a great night, actually. I think romance might be one of my kinks now, and maybe kink is is too loaded of a word but affection and a bit of romance are definitely important to me even if it's not going to be a long-term relationship his honesty about having romance as a kink was refreshing it made me realize what kind of sex he was looking for but also let me create enough space to avoid falling in love i knew it was safe being cuddly and cute with him without risking hurting his emotions if we ended up wanting different things i'll probably avoid telling people romance is a kink of mine because they'll probably think i'm just being cynical but i do think it's an interesting idea would you consider romance as a kink i just suddenly thought what if it's all a kink <laughs> Do you know what I mean? What, what life? Well, that's just the whole <laughs> life experience is a kink. Well, isn't that what we all ideally, essentially looking for? Is that romance and love, which seems to be so elusive. And mm. it's just like, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think <laughs> we all got that kink, Tom. Yeah, we're all suffering from that kink. If you want to put it that way. I all think so. Yeah. But, you know... I mean, ideally, but we're realistic, you know. But I guess if you put that label of kink on it, it doesn't yeah. have that connotation. So well, you, al truly, you allow truly. yourself to be a bit more lovey and affectionate with someone. And because you've called it a kink... Because it's role play. Yeah, it doesn't mean yeah, that exactly. anyone's trapped into That's a relationship done. right yeah. from the off. Role play. Mm. Mm. It's an interesting very, concept, isn't it? Very, very interesting. As long as there's a truth and honesty, which you know, with it, you know, you you're getting really into each other. You know, it's not pretense. Well, I don't know. But also, is is labelling it a kink just hiding behind a mask and pretending that you don't want to commit to something? Don't want to commit. So yeah, yeah. Good point. Could be. Good point. Yeah, yeah. But I guess some mm -hmm. people might feel safe with that. There's something about romance which is about honouring the fact that you deserve to be loved as a person. Mm. And I think that's something that quite a lot of queer people s like suffer with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wonder whether this is a bit of a get out clause for that. Mm. Yeah. But also it might be an in. Mm. A get in clause. Yeah, it might lead <laughs> to a sort of more sustainable kink yeah i mean you don't have to buy the outfits do you something about the word kink implies something that's very very quick quick and fast moving and it's not sustainable no okay. well 
I don't know, really. It's a, it's, it's a personal idea. I mean, it's got a person where he calls it a king, but I think essentially he's really looking for love and marriage, darling. Have we, uh, do you feel like we've answered the question or do we feel like we're just debating it as a topic? Um, I don't know. I don't know. What, uh, do you have any kinks, Les, other than romance? No, not really. I'm pure vanilla, really. Although, you know... <laughs> I've had lovers that, you know, I would try things with them because I like them and then realise, you know, it's bound and gagged to be like, that ain't me, girl. Get this <laughs> shit off of me. You know, I had to go through it. I just could not give back, not have freedom to move or detect. I to, I'm the one who's in control, really, and I had to learn, realise that. I didn't understand it and I keep on learning um, things about myself, which is quite refreshing. But no, no kinks, no like the piss or I've got to wear, it's got the smell of leather or sniffing old knickers or shit you pack. No, no, oh. not really. Just a bit of romance. So romance might be your kink. <laughs> <laughs> no, any kink, girl. I mean, <laughs> the idea of it's nice, you know, but, um, and I've had boyfriends, but I would find it very difficult because. Men, as a, a, a don't let me gain as a sex, <laughs> they love one drink going elsewhere, mm. and it's taking the commitment out of real romance. Or mm. I don't know, it's, com it's complicated, isn't it? Very, yeah, yeah. I can't even remember what the actual question was in the end. Whether would we, was a kink? would we consider romance as a kink? I would consider it. Yeah, <laughs> you Tom did it as a king. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, yeah. That's but I, I hadn't is. before that question. Mm. Hadn't before the question, and I think in that context of gay men, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Because it's yeah. It made me think actually of people that are very. Oh, you're amazing! I really want to get to know you more, and then they sort of like bit ghost you after that. Yeah, you yeah. know, that's it. Yeah. That's so, okay. That's so man. Yeah, no, it's yeah. So, that's so male. It's all in the moment. You know, they love you in that moment. And they really do. But tomorrow's another day. Yeah. I loved you. But I, you said you loved me. Yes, but that was yesterday. Yeah. Well, there you go. There we have it. Romance is a kink. Maybe that suits men down to the ground. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Les, we've come to the end of the episode. You've been so fabulous. Thank you so, so much for coming on. I, I really hope so. You I were... mean, I, it was my pleasure, it really was. And I've, I'm very flattered. I have to get attention, but it's, it, you know, things like when people say that about my, um, my appearance on that programme, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. It's just that people just like truth or honesty someone who just seems to be a bit comfortable do you know what I mean yeah. and perhaps it's a thing everyone's sort of pretending especially it the young people you it know. shines through yeah and I think yeah, that does good. come with age I don't know what you were like as a young person but that feels like I think I was kind of similar if you watch those old I was kind of it, it watched Michael Clark's things we did performances that we did in the 80s they seem so relevant now. All well, the children are doing that now. And we were quite outrageous. There's a conversation with me and Lee Barry where we were camping and outrageous to tits. And we're going about that. Oh, look at them, girl. They're all dancing on their grave, which was a, a, a biography by this amazing ballerina called Gelsey Kirkland, who did coke and starved herself and everything. She, uh, uh, and, and everything is a fascinating book. I said, and, and Lee said, oh, yes, they all dance in their graves. I mean, they're starving themselves to death, which was a truth. But, um, yeah, we've always kind of been in your face. Mm. Not to shock, but that's why we, we liked each other's honesty, you know, and and those sort of people are my friends. People are like, I mean, uh, listen, every day is a learning experience, you know. You find out about yourself and things, and I think I'm very flattered, but... I'm just on a journey of knowing myself and how people see me, which is interesting. Well, I'm really looking oh, forward no, to when we get to actually meet you in person. I think I would love to meet you in person. I'd love to meet you too. Honestly, I'm not just saying that. I feel like, I mean, just even when you said 
that what old queen I went go go <laughs> you know honouring the old queen I loved it I said you know, you know well that's inspired by something that was, was said about Bernie yeah someone called me that on a night out and I and I was you were an old queen yeah they t- well oh, they you said look very, you look very heterosexual to me Bernie well uh, well obviously I'm not straight acting straight looking <laughs> yeah. you know they, that's another thing straight acting straight you know you go in those sites and they would say straight tapped straight looking what the fuck and she's, and she's a bigger Mary than you are totally you know? Yeah, who cares about that shit? Who cares uh, but, about that shit? But yeah, yeah. Their, 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 a friend asked why, uh, how they knew people, and they went, "Oh, I know Bernie," and they, and they went, "What that old queen?" And, oh. <laughs> and I was a bit offended, but then I just thought, Do "You know what? I'm going to I'm going to turn it into a positive, yes. and this is going to be my podcast." So. Yes, I mean, I went on that that program. I didn't want to look like a clown and all colours and look like uh, you know flamboyant queen and give it all that. You know, I went on with a beard, a fat face, looking like, you know, a fisherman, I thought. And that was like the new drag. And someone You've said, got a gorgeous <laughs> face. Your face is just gorgeous. And oh. I really enjoyed drawing your face for Sue. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought you were beautiful on it. You are a beautiful man. I, I put that on my parents. They just give us honesty. You know, my brothers, as much as it, you know, the gay thing in the Jamaican... Thing. I would. I never mentioned it. It's no need, to, child. <laughs> and no need to. But they respected me, and that was very unusual in that situation. And, and my parents realised how liberal and wonderful they were. You know, as people, I feel very fortunate to have been born. But just the acceptance and let us do what we do because that's what we wanted to do. I love them. Amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, please say goodbye to our lovely audience, who I'm sure have fallen in love with you. I hope so. But <laughs> lovely to, to be on your show and to be a guest. I was, I'm totally honoured and totally flattered. Thank well, you. well, we are too. Tommy, say goodbye. So goodbye, much. lovely listeners. Goodbye, Tommy. <laughs> lovely to meet you. I can't wait to meet you in the flesh. And you, Bernie. <laughs> can't wait to meet you, bloke, in the flesh. Or we can go into restaurants or just be for coffee, you know, somewhere. You yeah. know? Yeah. Get into the building, just a, whatever. Let's do it. Let's, Sounds like let's fun. Be positive. Yeah. Thank and you. all the best with your podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for being on it. Thank you for listening, and we will see you next time on <laughs> What That Old Queen. You have been listening to What That Old Queen, written and presented by Tom Marshman and Bernie Hodges. The show was produced by Bernie Hodges for Hodge Podcasting in 2021. If you have a question for the old queens, or you'd like to be a guest, or you want to sponsor a show and give us lots of money, you can email hello at thatoldqueen.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter.